You're a holiday powerhouse. You host the dinners, shovel neighbors, sidewalks, and make everything from scratch. You definitely don't need help making the holidays happen. But Dunkin's Holiday Blend Coffee? A warming medium roast complete with sweet notes of dried fruit and molasses. Or a cranberry orange muffin made with real cranberries just might convince you a little help never hurt. Especially the hot caffeinated kind. America runs on Dunkin'. Present participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. This season, only Verizon gives you a free 5G phone with select trade-in and select 5G unlimited plans. And another gift. A service plan is required for gifts. That's a value of up to $1,900. But act now. This deal won't last long. 5G phone. Up to $999.99 device payment purchase or full retail purchase with new or upgrade smartphone line required. Less up to $1,000 trade-in slash promo credit applied over 36 months. 0% APR. Additional terms and conditions apply. Visit Verizon.com for offer details. Up to $1,900 value based on 5G phone, watch, tablet, and earbuds. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson. It is Sunday evening, I guess Sunday night, uh, here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, you guys know I'm out here for uh, for a little bit, kind of reconnecting with the wife a little bit, kind of enjoying some downtime, but the show must go on. So she's working tonight, so I've got the house to myself. So I'm working through this, and uh, we've got a lot of good things to talk about. A wild weekend in the Southeastern Conference that is sure to shake up the bowl pecking order. A lot of people are wondering, Steve, what bowl are we going to? Well, we won't know for sure until next Sunday. Uh, But the reality of it is, is with South Carolina beating Clemson, that gives them an 8-4 record. There are now three 8-4 teams in the Southeastern Conference, Mississippi State, South Carolina, and Ole Miss. Of those three, South Carolina, in my estimation, is the most attractive. They, in my estimation, will get the Citrus Bowl in the event that LSU drops from the New Year's Six. And with LSU's unexpected loss at Texas A&M, that shakes a lot of things up. So that could move everybody down. Instead of us getting four teams in a New Year's Six or the playoff, we could get three, which would have LSU going to the Citrus, which would bump Mississippi State down. But as it stands today, it appears that a Florida Bowl game is still very much a possibility. So a lot of people have messaged and asked about that and tagged me and post on Facebook. I haven't gotten to all of them, so I'll address it here. So I think it's important to kind of understand how things have shaken out and how the weekend's games impact Mississippi State's bowl standing. Now, we're not going to end up in a Liberty Bowl. That's not going to happen. We were just there last year. But also, too, there are a lot of other teams beneath us in the pecking order. We'll break that down today. And, of course, we'll look at uh, kind of how the weekend was it was good for us because, you know, we won on Thursday, so you could enjoy Friday's games and Saturday's games, kind of knowing we had the hay in the barn, so to speak. And so there may be some outside noise as I'm uh, while I'm here. I'm also being, uh, you know, kind of Mr. Uh, housekeeper, too. You know, got the got the uh, dishwasher going and the clothes washer. And so if you hear some, some unusual background noise, that's what it is. But, uh, but outside of that, of course, I'm here alone and uh, talking to you guys about Mississippi State sports. Happy to be here. Uh, to say the least, but um, eager for you guys, too, to kind of have an understanding of where things sit and kind of what we're expecting. But, yes, Mississippi State will get a good bowl destination. They have earned that. And, of course, uh, fifth best record in the Southeastern Conference, right? Who expected that at the beginning of the year? I think most people felt like, again, we'd be 8-4. and four. Probably a best-case scenario for us is let's go 8-4 and four and get the egg back and possibly get into a Florida bowl game, and now here we are. There are still some rumors out there about Mike Leach and his health, and, and I, I can tell you I have not pried too much about all of that, but I have asked some questions when the opportunity has presented itself. And I am told Mike Leach has no plans to retire this year. Zero. Now, that that may change, right? I mean, we, we never know what somebody's dealing with. I mean, all of us you know, have a cross to bear. We never know what's, what's really going on. But the reality of it is, is based on uh, my conversations with some people close to Mike Leach, some people that are uh, in his employment, shall we say, they have told me there has been no discussion with the staff about Mike Leach retiring this year. That They they just kind of laugh all of that off because Mike is such a competitor, and they said that he will coach as long as he wants to. And that's not to say that one day he won't get to Key West, Florida, and think, you know, this is enough. I think I've done all I need to do. So I never rule anything out, but I'm not expecting – a coaching change at Mississippi State this year. And, again, there had been no conversations about moving on from Mike Leach had he lost the egg ball. I know there were some people out there kind of pretending to be in the know, but at the end of the day, it ends up being a 
a moot point because Mike Leach and Mississippi State win the battle for the golden egg. How about that? All right, let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company, longtime sponsors of the show. My youngest son is also an employee at Bulldog Burger Company now. Very proud of him and happy for him to be a part of that great family. I've had so many people that have told me what a great working experience it is. And now that I've got a man on the inside, I have heard firsthand about how great it is to work there. So if you're looking for employment, maybe perhaps the Eat With Us group and Bulldog Burger Company could be a home for you. If you're just looking for a great dining experience, Bulldog Burger Company can get that done for you very, very easily. It's what they do every single day. Great service, great food, great portions at a great price. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Star Vegas. Brand new patio area. Be sure and go check that out. Things are getting a little bit cooler. They do have the chimneyas out there in the patio area so you can remain warm but also enjoy uh, kind of being outside, some outside dining. In addition to that, of course, there is uh, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo and Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Be sure and go check them out today. Get that good restaurant-quality hamburger. You'll be glad you did. One of the fine delicacies we afford ourselves in life. Have the spring rolls. They will make you better looking. And I am a big proponent of the dessert to go, so be sure and get that chocolate shake. Maybe like 10 minutes before you ask for the check. Let your server know. like to add a chocolate shake to our experience. We'll take you with us. They'll whip that bad boy up for you. You can ride that ride with a smile. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, let's take a look at the wild weekend it was in the Southeastern Conference. Of course, Mississippi State wins 24-22. We recapped that game uh, before I left Mississippi to head out west here. Uh, a, lot, a lot of good feedback about that show. And I think a lot of people, too, just the euphoria of having the egg back. And, of course, the golden egg is on tour. You can uh, check the hellstate.com to find out if it's going to be somewhere near you. But, uh, again, a huge win for Mississippi State. Mississippi State now ranked in the final regular season top 25 poll. There will be another one next week, of course, once the championship games are played. We expect State to, to stay in there. We couldn't lose ground. We don't play a game. But when you begin to think that State and Ole Miss are both 8-4 and four, and State beat them head-to-head in their most recent game, State should be ranked. Ole Miss shouldn't be. And, of course, they've lost four of five, which I think in many respects impacts their bowl standing. On Friday, Arkansas beat Missouri. We've talked about that on the show for, for, I guess, a better part of a month, that I really felt that was going to happen, not just because of the fact that Missouri was playing better. Number one, Arkansas is not the team many people kind of suggested they would be, but also I'm I'm a conspiracy theorist. I always felt like they would find a way to get Missouri Bowl eligible. Now, take nothing away from the Tigers. They had to beat New Mexico State, and then, of course, you know, beat a pretty good Arkansas team. Not a great team by any stretch. But they win the game. And uh, even though they lost the fourth quarter, they win the game 29-27. So big win for Eli Drinkwitz. That's a very very young team at Missouri. Got a lot of young talent there. I think that's one of the reasons people were thinking, hey, we've made some strides this year and we've got some young talent. We're building from here. And so good for those guys to get that bowl uh, eligibility kind of under their belts, which means they'll get you know those bowl practices as well. Uh, I do think, obviously, there'll be a team on the lower end of the, of the SEC tie-ins, as they should be, the last, one of the last teams to get in. There is still the possibility, of course, that uh, a couple teams make it in on an APR exemption. Florida, Florida State, we expected Florida State to win this game, but, man, what a game it proved to be, 45-38. to 38. And F- Florida overcame two different double-digit deficits. They scored 17 – excuse me, Florida State scored 17 points in the third, and then Florida came back and met, made a game of it and had the ball – and a chance to tie the game late and just couldn't finish the deal off. But uh, Florida now 6-6. Six and six. Uh, A few weeks ago I talked about Florida was kind of a team to watch down the stretch. The schedule really laid out well for them. They did not take advantage of it. Florida State also uh, wins for the first time in four tries against Florida. Uh, Mike Norvell was the guy that entered the year really on the hot seat. A lot of people thought he was coaching for his job this year. Uh, they finished the year 9-3 and three with a 5-3 and three record in the Atlantic Coast Conference and uh, seems to be headed to a pretty good bowl game somewhere. So 45-38 winners is Florida State. Georgia Tech made a bit of a game of it. When I picked this one on Gene's page, I thought Georgia Tech would cover it. They did, barely, but they did. Uh, Georgia 37-14 winners. And just like we all expected, once the game got in hand, Georgia got pretty vanilla down the stretch. Uh, Stetson Bennett just 140 yards passing in the ballgame. McIntosh, the leading receiver and rusher, 
86 yards on the ground, 96 yards through the air. But uh, never really felt like Georgia Tech was, was really in this game. Even though it was only a 10-7 game at the break, you knew at some point Georgia's athleticism would take over and that home crowd would pull them on the victory. And, of course, uh, 13 points there in the second quarter to create a little more distance. Made it a 23-7 game heading to the fourth. Georgia wins the fourth quarter 14-7 and ultimately the ball game 37-14. One of the best games of the weekend, too. Major upset, uh, without a doubt, really legitimizing Beamer ball there in Columbia, South Carolina. They beat Clemson for the first time in forever. No longer will Shane Beamer or anybody else connected with the Gamecocks be asked about being a little brother. And this is a game, too. Clemson jumped out early to a 14-0 lead, and you look up at halftime, and it's only 23-14 Clemson. And then South Carolina begins to chip away. They outscore them 14-7 there in the third quarter. And then a great defensive effort in the fourth quarter and a late field goal to make it 31-30. And really the difference in this ball game was special teams play. And you'd expect that. You know, Shane Beamer uh, being Frank Beamer's son and, and being a former special teams uh, coordinator, you'd expect special teams to be good. They were. They had a couple of huge punts late. They were down to inside the Clemson 10. And Clemson just simply could not get things going through the air. Just 99 yards passing. Pretty crazy to think about that. But uh, great job by the Gamecocks. And I will admit, I was wrong about South Carolina. I thought they would struggle to make a bowl game this year. And now they're they're possibly headed to the Citrus Bowl or the Outback Bowl. So a nice warm destination for them. And their fans have always done a great job supporting that that program through thick and thin. And then for them to beat Clemson, if I am a bowl organizer, and, and let's go over this process again just to kind of make sure everybody understands. South Carolina will be an attractive bowl team because of the fact that, yes, they're 8-4, and four, and State is 8-4 and four as well, but South Carolina's highs are a bit higher. Back-to-back top 10 wins for South Carolina. But how this process works is each bowl-eligible team in the league will submit a list of three bowl destinations they would prefer. On the flip side, all, th- all of the bowl tie-ins will send in their three. And then Greg Sankey's office will begin to kind of pair up from there. So the bowls themselves do not choose outside of the Citrus Bowl. The Citrus Bowl gets their own pick. They usually take the highest team not in the New Year's Six in the SEC standings. And as it stands today, that would be either LSU or South Carolina. Now, if LSU upsets Georgia, then LSU then elevates again to a New Year's Six classification. They're not there right now. I think most people would agree LSU likely out of the New Year Six uh, after that upset loss on yesterday. Louisville and Kentucky, this game, I expected it to be a better game than it proved to be, and but give Kentucky some credit here. Kentucky is very tough at home, as we know firsthand. They are a team and a program that likes to shorten the game on you. They just kind of grind it out. It would be interesting to see what they look like next year without Chris Rodriguez, who is probably – Probably probably the best player on a mediocre team in the Southeastern Conference. They win the game 26-13, and again, it's back and forth, back and forth, 13-7 there at the break. And you feel like, okay, third quarter, Louisville needs to make a play. But instead, Kentucky outscores them 10 nothing in the third and really removed all the drama from this game. Louisville outscores them 6-3 in the fourth quarter, but by that time, the game was pretty much in hand for the Wildcats, who finished the year 7-5 and five, and 3-5 and five in the league. And let's not forget some people – projected them to be an SEC East contender and to potentially beat Georgia this year. They did give Georgia a little trouble last week, but uh, just simply couldn't score. Just didn't have the athletes to do it. And this, again, is one of those games that we looked at in hindsight and said, you know what, we blew it. But every team has that argument. Every team can say, you know what, look at all the what-ifs and the should-have-beens. Everybody does. We think we should have beat LSU, we should have beat Kentucky. And you know what, I still contend to you, Kentucky beat us. We didn't play well. They beat us. They dictated terms to us. We should have won at LSU, which would have made us a 9-3 and team and potentially in the mix for a New Year's Six game, potentially. But the way things are shaking out, I don't know if nine wins would be enough. But uh, the Wildcats with a big win late over their rival. And Kentucky, uh, pretty, pretty impressive non-conference winning streak. And as my wife pointed out yesterday, I, well, how in the world did you pick Louisville? No one that. Well, maybe you should get a show. Okay, Iron Bowl, 49-47 winners are Alabama. And listen, Auburn gave them a fight early. We knew in the end that probably Alabama's 
superior athletic talent would win out. They did. But really, by halftime, this game was kind of in the bag for Alabama. It was 35-14 to 14 at Auburn. Against Auburn, excuse me. And then, in, you know, the, the second half was pretty even. But ultimately, the game was decided uh, at the break. And, of course, Auburn not wanting to make a decision or make an announcement or even an official offer about their head coaching job until after the Iron Bowl. I respect the Cadillac Williams. I respect that decision. Things are kind of appear to be kind of in a free fall since then. I don't know if that's truly the case, but uh, it wouldn't be an Auburn coaching search without some drama. It's kind of funny how that all happens. Cadillac Williams will not get the job, barring something totally unforeseen. But what he has done down the stretch at Auburn is impressive. And I'll miss him being in this conference. I think he'll ultimately you know, have a spot at Auburn. He is an Auburn man through and through. But I also think this is a situation where Cadillac Williams had the opportunity to coach his alma mater. They played very, very hard for him. If I'm UAB, maybe I call him. I don't know that he would take the job. He didn't need the money. But if he wants to be a head coach, that would be a really good opportunity. But uh, Alabama now 10-2, and 6-2 and two overall, and uh, a lock for a New Year's Six Bowl game. A lock. There's some people that think they have an outside shot at the playoffs. I'm not totally convinced. I think you would need absolute chaos in order for that to happen. There was a little chaos, obviously, with LSU losing at A&M. LSU was the number five team in the playoff. They're now 9-3, and three, a game behind Alabama, but 6-2 and two in the league. They win the West outright due to the tiebreaker over Alabama. So they'll play Georgia next weekend. They looked incredibly disjointed against Texas A&M. And Texas A&M... It appeared they treated it like their Super Bowl. Of course, there is no bowl game for them. But the reality of it is they had no incentive whatsoever to go out there and play hard other than for their seniors. And they did. And I really thought that uh, Moose Muhammad was outstanding. There were a couple big catches that he made that I think most people wouldn't make. 94 yards for him. And, of course, that really big touchdown in the double coverage, an incredible throw uh, by Wegman there. Just absolutely on the mark there. But uh, in the fourth quarter – when LSU had a chance to make a game of it, Jaden Daniels began to kind of break down a little bit. A&M punished him as a ball carrier and kind of put him in some bad situations. He had to leave the game a couple times. Nussmeyer has to come in. And then that impacts your play calling a little bit. But A&M, 14 big fourth-quarter points to kind of remove all doubt about this one. Huge win for Jimbo Fisher. And it probably puts them in a situation now where they say, hey, we went out and scored 38 points. We, we rarely ever score over 24 so we don't need to change our offensive scheme or our play calling. We just needed Connor Wegman. He's a better quarterback than what we've had. So that'll be the argument, obviously, for the Jimbo Fisher supporters. I just don't know if that argument is very good. Uh, the flip side of it is a lot of people have come out today saying that A&M should be a contender in the West next year. Uh, that's the same song, different verse. We hear that all the time, that it's time for the Aggies to take a step. And there are a lot of people involved with Aggie football that thinks they should be Alabama. They have a huge fan base. They have the second largest budget in all of college athletics. They have a tremendous stadium. It's a great experience down there. But yet, they're an 8-4 and four team, more years than not, this year 5-7, and seven, a team that was, what, preseason number six and ends up being seventh in the Southeastern Conference when it's all said and done. Pretty nuts. Of course, they, they, and, they and Auburn end the year with the same record, but a, Auburn beats a them head-to-head. So when you, when you pack it, unpack it all, Texas A&M dead last in the SEC West. my uh, Tennessee and Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt went back to being Vanderbilt. We expected a very motivated Tennessee team. We expected them to come out and play with purpose. They did a 56 to nothing shellacking, despite the fact Hendon Hooker is out for the season. Milton, a good game for him, 147 yards. Uh, Jalen Hyatt, 86 yards to lead the team. This game was never in question. Vanderbilt could still sneak in with an APR exemption. But Tennessee at 10-2 and two and 6-2, you feel like that they're, they certainly should be in a New Year's Six Bowl game. So congratulations to Josh Heupel and everybody connected with Tennessee football. I don't know that many – you know, I thought they would be good this year. I, I did. I, th- I thought 9-3. and three. I, I'll go back and listen to that show uh, eventually. But I, I think I had them 9-3. and three. But 10-2 uh, and because I didn't have them beating Alabama – that is a great year at Tennessee, and it's been a long time since Tennessee has played relevant football in the month of November. Shop Macy's Cyber Monday deals for big savings on gifts they'll love now while supplies last, like 50 to 60% off boots and shoes for her, 60% off cashmere sweaters from Charter Club, 
and 20 to 65% off the hottest toys of the season from Discovery, VTech, and more. Plus, get free curbside or store pickup and try same-day delivery now at Macy's. Details at Macy's.com slash pickup. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. This season, only Verizon gives you a free 5G phone with select trade-in and select 5G unlimited plans. And another gift. A service plan is required for gifts. That's a value of up to $1,900. But act now. This deal won't last long. 5G phone, up to $999.99 device payment purchase or full retail purchase with new or upgrade smartphone line required. Less up to $1,000 trade-in slash promo credit applied over 36 months. 0% APR. Additional terms and conditions apply. Visit Verizon.com for offer details. Up to $1,900 value based on 5G phone, watch, tablet, and earbuds. You're a holiday powerhouse. You host the dinners, shovel neighbors, sidewalks, and make everything from scratch. You definitely don't need help making the holidays happen. But Dunkin's Holiday Blend Coffee? A warming medium roast complete with sweet notes of dried fruit and molasses. Or a cranberry orange muffin made with real cranberries just might convince you a little help never hurt. Especially the hot caffeinated kind. America runs on Duncan. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. All right, let's look at the final standings for the regular season. Of course, uh, Georgia wins the East with an 8-0 record. They're 12-0. And uh, win or lose in the SEC championship game, Georgia is headed to the playoff with a chance to defend their national championship. Tennessee is second, 6-2 in the league, 10-2 overall. And, again, there's no reason they won't be in the New Year Six. Put together a perfect 7-0 home game, uh, home record this year. South Carolina, 4-4 four four in the league, 8-4. and four. They finished third outright in the SEC East, a game ahead of Kentucky, who was 3-5 and five and 7-5. And, five. and of course, the difference between the two is the fact that South Carolina goes into Lexington and wins that game. I really expected South Carolina to end the year on a three-game losing streak. And what do they do? They win two of those three games. So an impressive, impressive season for South Carolina in year two of the Shane Beamer tenure. But Kentucky... I told you guys beginning of the year I wasn't sold on Kentucky or Will Levis. They did nothing to change that. Of course, their their biggest win is uh, Mississippi State. It still sticks in the crawl a bit, does it? I, <laughs> Billy Napier, first year at Florida, I still think Billy will be okay. I think the brand of offense that he runs and the amount of talent that's available to him, Florida will be just fine. But you know the natives are reckless down there at 6-6 six and six and a 3-5 and five uh, record in a regular season. They end up being a three-way tie with Kentucky, Florida, and Missouri. But 6-6 six and six and you lose the game to your rival, there, there is not a lot of confidence in Gainesville right now. And I think a lot of it, too, kind of stems from the defense. They allow a SEC East next to worst 345 points on the year. The only team to allow more points in the SEC East was Vanderbilt. That's not a statistic that uh, – that you want to own right there. Missouri, and, and really inspired play by Missouri down the stretch, 3-5 and five in the conference, 6-6 six and six overall, and winners of their last two. I don't know that – like when you begin to think about the possibilities of who they would play in a bowl game, I don't know that I would want to play Missouri. You know, let's say you're a, big, a mid-level Big 12 team and all of a sudden you got to go square off of Missouri. Could that be Vegas? Could that be Liberty Bowl? Who knows? I know Liberty Bowl officials have spent a lot of time in Missouri, probably thinking they would get them. And I was listening to the Missouri broadcast on Friday as I was driving to New Mexico. That's one thing they mentioned. The, the, the two bowl games they hear the most about are Vegas and the Liberty Bowl. I know some of you would love to go to Vegas. I am not a proponent of that, not because I'm unwilling to go to Vegas, but we need to practice time. The date of that bowl game I don't think works well for us. You know, we had that with the Armed Forces Bowl too. You know, we, we didn't always get our bowl practices in. We'd like to be able to do that this go around. Now, Vanderbilt finishes dead last in the East, as expected. But this is not your typical Vanderbilt team. Of course, a couple of big wins over Florida and Kentucky. You know, two and six in the league. But you begin to look at down the stretch, Clark Lee had the guys playing well. Again, not the best team in the country, as he, you know, prognosticated. But the reality of it is, is that uh, Vanderbilt's better this year. And five and seven, and again, could get in on an APR exemption. There will not be enough bowl eligible teams unless unless I've missed something. I think there will be some five and seven teams that actually make a bowl game. Vanderbilt could be one of them. Could be a good story. And have every team from the East make it? Wow. Of course, uh, winners of the 
SEC West, LSU 6-2, and 9-3 and overall, and we do expect them to lose next week, which would give them four losses and certainly keep them out of the New Year's Six. In the event they win, they upset Georgia. I'm not expecting that, but in the event they do, they end up with a 10-3 and record and then a win over number one Georgia, which would then elevate them back to the New Year's Six. I don't think there's any chance of making the playoffs unless there's just an absolute anarchy next weekend. But a win would put them in a New Year's Six. If they're not in a New Year's Six, I think LSU is easily the Citrus Bowl pick from the SEC. I don't think there's any question. Nine and three, they win the West. So you have the better record of the regular season above South Carolina and Mississippi State. And you played in an SEC championship game. I think that's very attractive. And LSU folks always travel well. Everybody would love to go to Disney World anyway. We mentioned Alabama earlier, also 6-2 and two and 10-2. and two. No, no doubt about them being in a New Year's Six. Just a matter of kind of where they go and how the, how the lay of the land works out after next weekend's championship game. Still some ebb and flow with every bit of that. And then there's State. And so last week we talked about we needed some things to go our way to get our first ever Citrus Bowl invitation. They didn't. We didn't get much help at all other than the fact that Tennessee beat Vanderbilt. We didn't need Tennessee losing and dropping out of the New Year's Six race either. Either we needed all four teams – they were projected to be New Year's Six or playoff teams to remain there. That didn't happen. So then with South Carolina beating Clemson, in my, in my mind, there's no doubt you pick them over Mississippi State. And then with LSU losing, that kind of changes the dynamic entirely. So if I'm Greg Sankey, of course, you know LSU will get picked by the Citrus you got to take South Carolina over Mississippi State, which to me means South Carolina would head to the outback which would put Mississippi State in the Gator Bowl. Yes, another trip to Jacksonville. There are many times we would have dreamed of going to Jacksonville. We've had some good memories in that stadium. But perhaps that's where we're headed back to. It would be our fourth trip to Jacksonville since 2010. So four times in 12 years. And I've seen some people out there projecting us for the Texas Bowl. I'm told that the Texas Bowl would have been one of our teams, one of our, our, our favorites. But the reality of it is, is now that uh, we've had so much traffic clear behind us, the Texas Bowl is a possibility, but it's down to list some. Ole Miss also 8-4 and 4-4, four and, four and, four, and again, losers of 4-5. or five. Ole Miss felt like they had an opportunity to be in the New Year 6. And, uh, again, I think everybody, to be fair about this, many of you saw it the way that I did, that the way this schedule was so front-loaded that they would get off to the great start and then stumble down the stretch. And I think when you look at how things went down the stretch for them, they were competitive in those games. They absolutely were. You're a play away from beating Mississippi State, a play away from beating Alabama. So they're a very solid 8-4. and four. But the thing you begin to ask yourself, with all this angst about Lane Kiffin's flirtations with Auburn, and then, of course, uh, losing 4 of 5, you know, would the, would the casual fan buy a ticket to go watch Ole Miss play in a bowl game? I think they could probably end up in a Tennessee bowl game, maybe perhaps there in the Texas Bowl. You know, we'll see how things go. And, again, I will put some – pen to paper here in the next day or so uh, before we get together again and kind of look at who's been where more recently and begin to kind of project this bowl picture of my own. I'll give you guys uh, my thoughts on it. You know, we've been pretty accurate the last couple of years, but, um, you know, sometimes things change. You know, there's sometimes there's a bowl and a team out there that really, really want each other. And like, say, for an example, let's say that Arkansas wanted to go to Texas and they put that as their number one. And let's say the Texas Bowl wanted Arkansas. They put Arkansas as number one. Well, if nobody else picks Texas first, that's an easy decision to make. You just send Arkansas to Texas. And speak of the Razorbacks, of course, they are bowl eligible at six and six, but three and five in the league. There are a lot of people, too, that really felt like Sam Pittman was a bad hire. He proved to be a much better coach than people uh, expected. But this year has been different. And, yes, they've had some injuries with K.J. Jefferson. They have. Uh, they have some talent out there, but defensively they have been absolutely abysmal. 368 eight points, excuse me, 345 points against and uh, nearly lost to uh, Southeast Missouri State. You may recall that. In the end, Rocket Sanders and those guys willed them to a win. But Arkansas will be headed to a bowl game, the last team in the SEC West to achieve bowl eligibility. And then there is Auburn and A&M, both with five and seven records. And there is a possibility that Auburn could make it a bowl game. You know, we'll see. I hadn't looked at the APR numbers, but last week I was told Auburn was right there. a and I don't know if we even really looked at that closely because we expected them to lose the game. They had a 4-7 and seven record overall playing the SEC West champion. We thought, well, surely LSU will handle business. So we'll have to see where A&M kind of, handle, you know, kind of ends in all this. But uh, when it's all said and done, 
there are three teams in the Southeastern Conference that end the year with a losing record. That's Vanderbilt, Auburn, and Texas A&M. Vanderbilt and Auburn both picked to finish dead last in their respective divisions. A&M, kind of the outlier there. Again, if we mentioned they were a preseason top ten team, preseason number six, and they don't even finish sixth in the SEC West. Kind of ironic how it all works out here. But, uh, again, that's where things end up. And, uh, again, I think if, if, you, if you're honest with yourself – Beginning of the year, if we'd all said eight and four with the egg back in a Florida bowl game, we would take in that and run with it and felt great about life. And then when you get through the, the rigors of the season, you realize, oh, we should have won this one. You know, I could make an argument, though, you know, we sh- probably should have lost to Auburn, right? I mean, it took a, a, a light, late effort for us to pull that thing off. You know, with Massimo Biscardi getting chilled a couple times and ends up knocking it through the uprights to, uh, you know, to tie the ball game, and eventually we win it. And so an, an impressive season for Mississippi State. Should we be happy about it? Yes, we should. Should we be satisfied? Absolutely not. I think Mississippi State can be better than an 8-4 team, but I think considering the quality of the schedule and uh, the fact that we picked up Georgia this year, again, I think Mike Leach has had to play him two out of three times. If memory serves me correct, it's been three of five, three times in the last five years we played Georgia. It's one of those rare teams that we face from the east and with the schedule rotations changing and – Everybody thinking that we're going away from divisions and away from pods. Just do one division. The top two teams at the end of the year will play in the SEC championship game. So you won't have an SEC East winner or West winner. That's not official, but that appears to be the direction things are going. There are also some people within the league that tell me that the nine-game SEC schedule is pretty much a formality now, that we do expect to go to nine SEC games. One of the discussions right now is if you go to nine conference games – does that mean you get rid of the Power 5 exemption, the Power 5 requirement for your non-conference? Because for teams like us, especially in leaner years, we're going to need that extra non-conference game, and we probably need it to be a G5 or FCS team. I mean, if we're going to play nine SEC games and we have proven that we can compete at that level, but sometimes you're going to have issues. Sometimes you're going to be a 6-6 six and six or 7-5 type team. And so if you have to play nine SEC teams and then a Power 5, it limits your ability to have home games but it also hinders your ability to get bowl eligibility in what would be a transition year or building. So we'll see how things go. We'll see how things progress. Uh, But the reality of it is state handles business. We get the golden egg back. And I think we can all rest in the security of knowing that, hey, we did take a step forward this year. Did we take as big a step forward as maybe some people hoped? Yeah, probably not. But I think we took a big step as far as what most people expected. We were seven and five last year. You're thinking, you know what? You find a way to get one game better, even though you've got a more difficult schedule. Because if you look at the Ole Miss-Mississippi State schedule, really the only difference, the only difference is the fact that they played Vanderbilt and we played Georgia. You know, if you flip that around, and State's probably a 9-3 and three team, uh, they're probably a 7-5 team, right? I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, the only difference in the schedule when it's all said and done was the difference in the SEC East rotating opponents. And so I think you can feel pretty good about that. And if you're if you're Mississippi State too, you look at how State did against the West this year. Well, you beat Arkansas, you beat Auburn, you beat A&M, you beat Ole Miss. So you're four and two against the West this year. You lose to um, is that right? Let's say we lose to Alabama, we lose to Georgia, we lose to Kentucky. What was the other loss? Now I think about it. LSU, yes. So yeah, we're end up being four and two in the SEC West and. Ole Miss, on the other hand, was two and four against the SEC West, and so, and uh, the two teams they beat were the teams that finished sixth and seventh in the conference. So I think when you begin to look at it, it, a lot of people want to measure Mississippi State's success against that of Ole Miss. I think even though we ended with the same record, you have to say Mississippi State had the better year. Mississippi State deserved another better bowl game. Mississippi State has the egg. Mississippi State, in my estimation, has more momentum. And if the, if the rumors are true that Lane Kiffin's about to sign a $9 million extension, which is incredible, considering where we were a few years ago with salaries within this conference, nine years, there's talk about an eight-year deal, and uh, the state of Mississippi require, well, caps state employment contracts to four years. So how you get around that is there are some guarantees. Maybe the foundation itself will guarantee four more years of salary, uh, to ensure, hey, no matter what happens, we'll pay you this. And I, so I've done the due diligence on this, but I had somebody tell me earlier if this deal was signed and approved that it would take $54 million 
to buy him out, but only $6 million for a team to buy him out. So if Ole Miss fires him, they got to pay him $54 million. It's crazy, man. It really is. And is that worth it? I mean, honestly, when you begin to think about it, you know, year one, Lane Kiffin was 500. He had one good year last year, really good year, no doubt about it. And then this year you go eight and four and lose four of your last five, including the game to your rival, and then you get a huge extension. So you're going to win you know, less games this year than you did a year ago. So it's like maybe you're – it's a small sample size, but are you really tr- truly trending in the right direction if that's the case? And I think almost people feel like, you know what, hey, this is our guy. We couldn't afford to lose him to Auburn, so we're going to overpay. And I think in the state of Mississippi at times you have to overpay to be competitive, to get a good quality coach. And Lane Kiffin's a good coach. I don't like the way he's handled himself on social media uh, the last couple of weeks. I don't like how he's going after John Sokoloff. I think that that whole thing is very petty and, uh, and immature. And I, I would have issues if he was my employee. That's just my estimation. Maybe you see things differently, but that's how I see it. Uh, but in the end, I think Mississippi State headed in the right direction. I think Mississippi State next year with an eight home game schedule and then our four road games essentially being toss-up games, we have a chance to have a special year. So hopefully we can kind of keep things in place. Will we have some portal attrition? We absolutely will. Will we have some coaches perhaps move on to other jobs? Yes, we will. But I think you keep the system in place, you keep the coaching staff in place as best you can, and uh, you move forward. But, yeah, we'll have some guys hit the portal. We will. And I've read some of these rumors out there, and there's always – this time of year, it's always ripe with rumors. You know, there's always somebody that knows something that knows somebody's cousin or uncle that works with a, a guy that was used to date a girl that knows the player's mom. There's always that, that convoluted chain of chatter. Uh, but the reality of it is that this is, the, this is when things begin to happen. This is when players get on a move. This is when coaches get on a move. And we'll keep you abreast of all that as best we can over jeanspage.com. Be sure and go check us out. All right, let's take a look at today's top ten list. And in honor of uh, the fact that State won, we're going to do a winning top ten. As always, top ten list brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. You know Blair. Blair is that guy. Blair is the guy that knows everything there is to know about the mortgage business. 21 years of experience in the mortgage business. And, guys, we're really focusing right now on people getting the first mortgages. That's what we're looking at. A lot of people out there that maybe have never had the opportunity to buy an owner home. This is your opportunity. Now is the time to make a move. Lenders are out there looking to make loans right now. There's there's not a lot of inventory in the market. So people are ready to get deals done. Get a guy like Blair Chandler working for you that can get your loan closed. 21 years of experience in the industry. Top 1% close ratio in the country. Back-to-back years. Nobody stays in any industry 20-plus years without having some know-how how to get things done. He can get you to the closing table. Whether you're a non-conforming borrower Perhaps you've got an atypical property. Blair has seen it all and done it all. Visit him at CloseWithBlair.com today. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Or give him a call or text. 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. And if you mention to him, you heard about him on the Boneyard, he will pay for your appraisal, which is about a $500 value. How cool is that? Just by listening to this show, you're saving a little cash. All right, top 10 winning songs winning songs it's a pretty diverse list here too we're going to do some classic rock we're going to do some modern rock we're going to do some alternative rock we're going to do some pop music do a little bit of all of it number 10 on the list one of my favorite bands that rose from the ashes of the creed break up with scott stapp they hired one of the greatest vocalists in my generation miles kennedy it's alter bridge and we're going to go with the great song my champion Number 10, My Champion. This song is a little deeper than it is about sports. you got people in your life that uh, have been there for you when nobody else has, when you've been through some difficult times. That's what it's about, My Champion. Number 11, we're going back. We're going to get a little rasp in our voice here. It's Live to Win from Motorhead. Motorhead has been prominently mentioned on this show many times. We even had a Motorhead top 10. I don't know that Live to Win made the top 10, so I'm happy to throw Lemmy a bone here. God rest his soul. Number eight on your list, one of my favorite alternative songs from years ago. I love the guitar on it. The tone is great. I like the vocal delivery. It's The Distance from Cake because we're going the distance. All right, number seven on the list, if I can read my notes here, uh, going back to the Van Hagar years. It's Top of the World by Van Halen. I like the Van Hagar years. I don't like them as much as David Lee Roth years. I, okay, I just lay it out there for you. 
but I'm, I'm not one of these all oh, Van Hagar sucks guys. You know, I, I think Van Halen had some great songs when Sammy Hagar was in the band. Top of the world is one of them. Sitting on top of the world. And that's how we feel after winning a golden egg. All right, number number six on your list, and again my notes are a mess. It's David Bowie. We're not going all the way back to the Ziggy Stardust days, but we're going with heroes. Because when you win the, the Egg Bowl, you're a hero, even if just for one day. And I always think about Randy Charlton. What a great play there. Didn't get caught up in the wash. He was athletic enough to circle back, and he bats that two-point conversion down. Probably the greatest two-point conversion defensive effort in the history of the program. I mean, how many times do you see somebody needing to score two to tie a ball game and you get the stop there? just doesn't happen very often. We talk about you know, Rocky Felker's two-point conversion to beat Memphis. You know, this may not have the same historical value, but because it was in an egg ball, it's one that we'll never forget. All right, number five on the list is the winner takes it all from ABBA. I don't know. We've had ABBA on here before. Maybe we have. But there we go. The winner takes it all. And that's how it is, Ole Miss people. You can like it or love it, but you're going to live with it either way. The bottom line is this. Mississippi State has the better season. Mississippi State has the egg. And State should have the better bowl destination in a year that some thought Ole Miss would win the West and go to Atlanta for the first time. And isn't it great that when they're eliminated, we can we can all celebrate and say, you know what, that's another year. We don't have to live, live with that crap, right? Number four on your list, I'm a Mississippi State guy. Been a Mississippi State guy my whole life. My first ball game was November 1st, 1980. We beat Alabama. The zenith of our program. John Bond was my hero. And while the games don't always go the way I expect them or that I want them, Mississippi State, in my estimation, is the best. So in honor of that, it's Tina Turner's the best. Simply the best. Number seven, number three on the list you know, it's like we needed to get over the hump a little bit. You know, first year of Mike Leach, we're like, well, you know, we had to play all these freshmen and we'll be better when they're juniors. And we really thought we'd have a really good team this year. I, I think we were a pretty good team. I don't know if we were a really good team. We were a pretty good team. We had some moments we didn't even look good. We had some other moments we looked elite. But we did take a step forward. I'm a firm believer that the best is yet to come. I think next year will be a very special season in Starkville. So we're going to go with Starships. Nothing's going to stop us now as your number three song on today's top ten list. Going back to the 1900s, a song that I don't think gets played enough, to be quite honest with you. And I think it maybe because it's not necessarily true to the rest of the catalog when you think about the core of the Santana catalog. You, you kind of think about you know, Carlos and kind of that incredible guitar tone and how everything's kind of got a Latin swing to it. This is not like that. And it's the song Winning from Santana. This is a little more mainstream rock radio type thing. So winning from Santana. But number one, and what else could it be? It's Queen, We Are the Champions, the greatest song ever about winning. And while you know we're Egg Bowl champions and hopefully we'll be bowl game champions somewhere, you know, at the end of the day, any year that we have a winning year and we capture the egg, that's a good year for us. May not be a great year, may not be a special year, but any year when you think back in the great memories of your life, any year that we don't beat Ole Miss, the year is incomplete. Like as great as 2014 was, and we rose to number one in the country for four weeks, we lost the Egg Bowl. And so we have to live with the fact that Ole Miss beat one of our best teams, arguably our best team of all time. And so the season ultimately ends up being incomplete. And if you win, maybe you get a chance to go to playoffs. I don't know. You know, we, I think we were probably going to be edged out by Ohio State no matter what. I mean, Kirk Herbstreet – Got out there and stumped for those guys every single week on that show and how the voters need to be Ohio State, Ohio State. Completely discounted us. We didn't do anything to help ourselves. And certainly losing the bowl game, I mean, the Egg Bowl against Ole Miss kind of removed all possibility. I don't think it knocked us in the playoffs. I think we were going to end up five or six anyway. But as great as that year was, the fact that we lost the Egg means an awful lot to us. So the fact that we won this year, when so many people all year long had us losing the battle for the Golden Egg, even in the pregame, or excuse me, the preseason bowl prognostications, just about everybody had us losing that game because it was in Oxford, not knowing the series history. But we went up there and we won the game. And we'll get it next year. And here's your hot take right now. You can clip it and shove it back in my face later. We're going to win the Egg Bowl again next year. 
We're going to be a better team than Ole Miss next year. We're going to have a better season than Ole Miss next year. We're going to have a better bowl game than Ole Miss next year. And so all of a sudden you start talking about the trajectory because, you know, four or five games into the season, everybody's like, oh, Ole Miss is leaving us in the dust. Ole Miss leaving us behind. Ole Miss not looking back at Mississippi State, and then here we are, you know, coming up like a train on the track, headed in the right direction lane, and running those guys over. And down the stretch, State was absolutely the better team. And people can say whatever they want to and say, well, you know, the team was distracted. Well, you know, that, that's that's part of the deal of being a coach is you got to be able to manage the expectations and emotions of your team. He didn't handle it. Mike Leach did. So ultimately, Mike Leach has the Egg Bowl trophy in his facility for the next year. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Book Mart. Of course, Campus Book Mart, a Starkvillian institution. You're familiar with them. If not, you should be. If you're looking for Mississippi State merchandise, look no further than Campus Book Mart. The bully shop has been completely renovated. Everything is upstairs now, which has allowed them to expand their selection of Mississippi State merch. Be sure and go check them out next time you're in town. If you can't make it to town and you've got Bulldogs on your Christmas list, and chances are you do, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, you get a phrase that pays. That is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that gets you free shipping on all orders over $75. Any order less than $75, bucks, absolutely incomplete. Again, that's campusbookmart.net, promo code BSR. All right, let's take a look at the final statistics and kind of how your Bulldogs ended up. Will Rogers leads the Southeastern Conference in passing 3,713 yards. We thought perhaps that he would have another 4,000-yard season. I uh, didn't quite get there. There were some, some expectations earlier this year that maybe he could – yeah, maybe surpass 5,000. He didn't do that. But 3,713, Stetson Bennett second on the list with 3,150. So, Will, nearly 600 yards over the second place guy, and you'd expect that in the in, in the system in which we run here. But, uh, again, 3,713 to lead the Southeastern Conference. So, Will will pro- probably get some all-SEC mentions by some publications. A lot of people, of course uh, – make those picks based on statistics and statistics alone. But Will struggled in some of the bigger games against the better defenses. And in order to really get that established, that you are one of the best in the Southeastern Conference, you got to do it in the games that really matter. And so that will be something that will probably keep him off some people's list. But uh, Hendon Hooker there at third, and Hooker, of course, uh, tears the ACL. I think when you begin to – if you look at the totality of things in the season that Hooker had and Tennessee had – you know, he probably deserves some mentions. But fourth on the list is Bryce Young. Will not win the Heisman Trophy this year. I don't know there's a better quarterback in the country, though, a guy that really leads his team uh, to victory better than Bryce Young. So Bryce Young probably a second-team All-SEC guy this year, probably. And then Spencer Rattler, 2,780, but he had some big moments. So Will, I think, certainly will be you know a guy that gets some mention in there. Could be a first-team guy, could be a second-team guy, but certainly worthy of some consideration, despite the fact that maybe he didn't hit the numbers uh, we expected. Looking at rushing stuff, and you know we're not going to be on this list nearly as prominently as we once were, but State doing a better job this year running the football. Probably didn't run it enough for my likes. Uh, There were some chances I thought we could have done a better job, but uh, Ole Miss's running back, Quinchon Judkins, leads the Southeastern Conference in rushing this year. Uh, edging out Raheem Sanders by 50 yards. Those, are you, those will be your first-team backs. And Judkins potentially an All-American. And, and that, it's remarkable to think that Lane Kiffin found this guy and just kind of sat on him for a while. And then ultimately he leads the SEC in rushing. 16 rushing touchdowns, too. Pretty incredible numbers for a young guy. Uh, down the list, former um, – excuse me, uh, Auburn running back, preseason All-SEC guy Tank Bigsby – Really picked it up down the stretch. Did not get to the 1,000-yard plateau, just 970. Finished fifth in the league uh, for him, but a good year. And I do think that that guy is a pro. I really do. I think it's just a matter of time before he hears his name called on draft day. Rodriguez, 904 yards. Uh, The top rushing bulldog is pretty far down the list. Jaquavius Marks, uh, 23rd in the league, 532 yards, and then – Dylan Johnson, 488. So they combined to go over 1,000 yards together. And that was one of those numbers earlier this year that we really felt like State needed to do was surpass 1,000 yards rushing as a team. Well, you do that this year. And, uh, again, Dylan Johnson a little bit banged up down the stretch, probably hurt 
his uh, his production as Woody Mark. That's the thing that you think about. These guys have been banged up much of the second half of the season. And so as a result, that probably influenced your play calling a little bit. But uh, if you get both of those guys back next year, I think you feel really good about the direction of things. I like our backs. I do. I think those guys play really, really hard. All right, receiving yards. And this is a thing here because we spread the ball out so much. And you didn't have that bell cow receiver this year. You don't have a guy near the top of the standings. Jalen Hyatt from Tennessee. Easily a first-team All-American, in my estimation, 1,267 yards receiving and 15 receiving touchdowns. 15. Former Bulldog uh, Malik Heath finished his fourth in the conference for 834 yards. Right behind him is Jonathan Mingo with 808. Both of those guys essentially non-factors in the Golden Egg. State did a great job on both of those. Uh, Rufus Harvey actually leads Mississippi State. Excuse me, Rara Thomas leads Mississippi State, 12th in the league at 626 yards, uh, seven touchdowns, probably none bigger than the one he had uh, against Ole Miss, even though he cramped up shortly thereafter. But Rufus Harvey, 24th, 472 yards, and I really feel like we're just beginning to scratch the surface on what we could have in Rufus Harvey. Is he a dominant player? No, he is not. But he is a very intriguing piece for Mississippi State, He's a guy, too, that has found a way on third down to get himself open and move the chains. I think we're just beginning to realize the weapon we have uh, in Rufus Harvey. Caleb Ducking got off to the big start earlier this year, had the eight touchdowns, uh, just 467 yards. And once he put some things on tape, people began to pay more attention to him, begin to shade coverage more his way. Tula Griffin, 28th in the league, 449 yards, and this the four uh, touchdowns there. And, again, I think Tulu's a guy, too, that um, – just really beginning to figure things out. Probably one of the biggest surprises on this list is 30, 30th in the in the league is Keishon Butte, 431 yards and just one touchdown. If I told you beginning of the year that Keishon Butte had one touchdown, you would think he was hurt probably in week two or three. Disappointing year for him, and it was supposed to be a money year for him. So we'll you know we'll see how things go with that. But uh, disappointing year for him, despite the fact LSU wins the West. All right, looking at sacks here, Will Anderson, no surprise there, Will Anderson of Alabama leads the league with 10 sacks. Just behind him is former Alabama and current Arkansas linebacker Drew Sanders, who also had 10. Harold Perkins, Jr., the phenom at LSU, eight, eight sacks. And this is a guy, too, that really didn't find his groove until maybe middle of the year, and he became a dominant player, had a great game against Ole Miss. Isaiah McGuire from Missouri was fourth with seven, tied with Jordan Dominique uh, from Arkansas. And that's one thing the Razorbacks did do a good job was getting after the passer. They couldn't, they couldn't defend the pass, but they could get to the passer. Tied for six is two Auburn players, Derek Hall and Colby Wooden, both of them with good games against Mississippi State. I think Derek Hall certainly will enter the NFL draft. Uh, t- tied with them – excuse me, Derek Hall was tied for fifth. Tied with Wooden – was Tyrus Wheat, Mississippi State's Ty Wheat. I think Ty has done enough to get his name on the draft boards. We did a good job getting him back in school this year. That's your NIL dollars at work. But six sacks on the year, 54 tackles, pretty impressive numbers uh, for him. Buki Watson uh, tied for eighth in the conference with B.J. Ojolari uh, from LSU. What will Buki Watson ultimately elect to do? Does he come back? I think he probably should. But I do think he is a guy that at the very least you know, will test the waters. Randy Charlton will not be back. He's uh, used his COVID year, but uh, three sacks for him, which is 12th good, 12th best in the league. And uh, again, a name that will live in infamy in Oxford. How about that? All right, looking at tackles, Buki Watson leads the Southeastern Conference in tackles this year with 108. Did you expect that? You probably didn't. Buki, number one, <clears throat> which will put him in line, obviously, to be uh, a all-SEC player. I don't think there's any question about that. And then Jed Johnson, third in the league at 103 tackles. And Jed Johnson's a guy that got absolutely snubbed by the SEC media in the preseason picks. And then he, not only does he finish third, he beats out many of the preseason all-SEC guys. Uh, Anthony Orja from Vanderbilt was second at 106. So you begin to think about Buki Watson and Jed. 211 tackles between the two of them. Pretty impressive numbers, to say the least. And uh, Jet with his first career sack this year, just just the one sack, which is kind of considering how much we, we blitz him, and he's part of our blitz package, you'd think he'd get there a little bit more. But he did influence the quarterback a great deal. 
So big, big year for both of those guys. Both should be all SEC guys. Jet may be a second team guy because he doesn't have name recognition. But how do you keep the leading tackler in the Southeastern Conference off your first team ballot? DeCamriana Richardson, ninth, leading all corners in the Southeastern Conference with tackles at 78. That's a big part of the Zach Arnett defense is how well those corners play against the run. They try to set the edge and do a good job. The only defensive back that had more tackles, two acts that had more than him, is DeMarco Hallams from Alabama and Otis Reese uh, from Ole Miss. But uh, DeCam out there on the corner, not a safety that's always walking up into the box, a guy that's having to defend his edge over there. And so a good year for him. Does he make an all-SEC list? I would say maybe, probably not. You know, Manuel Forbes certainly will. But anybody that was worried about a drop-off this year at corner losing Martin Emerson, you know, those, those concerns have been abated and then some. Emmanuel Forbes leads the Southeastern Conference with six interceptions. He has 39 tackles, and, of course, he did miss the one game and was somewhat limited in the other. But he also has 10 pass defenses this year. The number two interceptor, was Dwight McLaughlin, for, former LSU and current Razorback corner, had three picks. So Emmanuel Forbes with double, double what other guys had. Past defenses this year, Chris Abrams Drain, former LSU commitment, went to Missouri, 13 pass defenses to lead the league, uh, and generally drew the toughest assignment. Kool-Aid McInnistry, uh, second in the league with 12 pass defenses. Uh, the top bulldog was Emmanuel Forbes, who was fourth in the league with 10 pass defenses. I don't think there's any question Emmanuel Forbes will be a first-team All-SEC player. Could likely get some All-American mention as well. I think that's probably what you would expect. All right, looking for uh, return numbers, Tulu Griffin leads the Southeastern Conference substantially in kickoff return yards, 613 yards. The number two guy is Barry and Brown from Kentucky, 424 yards. Uh, Earlier this year, it was Devin Achain and Tulu both, and Achain gets a little bit banged up there. Uh, but averaging 32.26 yards a return, which is the most in the Southeastern Conference, by four yards. You could see Tulu get some All-American mention. I don't know how the rest of the conference, I mean, the rest of the country looks at kick returning, but when you think about the fact that so many people kicked away from Tulu and he still averaged over 32 yards and led the league in kickoff return yardage, uh, that's pretty significant. Of course, he had that big 92-yard kickoff return for touchdown uh, that really made all the difference. Xavier Thomas finishes fourth in the league uh, with uh, 23.75 as an average. Did not have nearly the opportunities that Tulu did, but uh, certainly a great a great year for Xavier Thomas as a freshman uh, who finished second in the SEC in punt return yards this year. The only returner that had more as a punt returner was Kool-Aid McKinnistry. He had 317. But Xavier Thomas, of course, didn't win that job until after the LSU game. So, you know, there's a handful of games he didn't even play as a punt returner. Ends up with a punt return for touchdown as well. So big year, and uh, I think people feel good about that kind of moving forward, uh, to say the least. Special teams was was quite the adventure for Mississippi State this year. It seemed like every week we had some sort of issue. We didn't in the Egg Bowl, which I think proved to be very significant. Uh, but you know, George, and maybe the last time I pronounced the name, George Geropolis finishes 11th in the conference with 1,243 yards punting, uh, Max Fletcher from Arkansas and Paxton Brooks from uh, Tennessee, the only ones that had less among the, the regulars. But uh, looking at you know yards per punt, George also 11th at 40.10. And here's the thing, too, and I understand there's always directional punting and things like that, but you went out and you spent all this time and effort to go out and recruit some punting, and uh, it got a little bit better. It did not get dramatically better. That is one of those things that's got to change. We have got to be in a situation kind of moving forward that we can count on special teams. If we get the kind of play that we got Thursday night, we're going to win a lot of ball games. There's no question about it. We are going to win a lot of ball games. Finally, looking at scoring, you know, total points, you know, lead, leading scores. You know, Devin Achain is a guy that uh, I expected a big year from. He had a good year, but uh, not maybe what most people expected. But, you know, Jaquavius Marks leads Mississippi State in scoring with 54 points this year. And, and that, would, that kind of stands to reason, considering that he is kind of your short yardage back when you get in the red zone. So I think you feel pretty good about that. All right, receiving touchdowns this year, we talked about Hyatt a little bit earlier. Uh, Caleb Ducking finishes third in the league with eight. Eight. And for a while, he and Will Shepard from Vanderbilt were going back-to-back, and then Hyatt just simply took off 
and left them behind. Returns for touchdown this year, Emmanuel Forbes leads the SEC with three. Three. How about that? Three. And there's only three players in the conference that had more than one uh, return for touchdown. So Forbes leads the Southeastern Conference, and again, it's kind of solidifying his candidacy as a uh, first-team All-SEC guy. Uh, total touchdowns. Jaquavius Marks with nine because he did have a couple receptions, but he's well down the list. They're tied for seventh. Uh, Quinchant Judkins from Ole Miss leads the Southeastern Conference with 17 total touchdowns. That's pretty impressive. Field goals, a bit of an adventure early in the year. It got better as the year went on, but it was never a situation where we ever assumed anything. Massimo Biscardi ends up having six field goals. Uh, ben Rabin had some success earlier this year. Uh, with four, but uh, again, not where we need it to be, and we missed some extra points earlier this year. It was a lot to that. That's got to get fixed. That's that's a burr in the bulldog saddle, to say the least. I and mean, we should never have to worry about, you know, executing the fundamental elements of football. That's a big part of it when it's all said and done. Is can you go out there and make the basic football play? And at times we struggled this year to do that, especially on special teams. And you know, I don't know how you even last year you shake it up. You move. You take. You take the responsibilities away from Matt Brock. You move Eric Mealy over there. You reshuffle the staff. You go out and you get a new kicker. You get a new punter. Uh, you made a bunch of changes, and then still couldn't find consistency. And so I just I, I share that because we want to call it for what it is. Now, I don't know that we got the the level of improvement that we expected, nor that we deserved after making all these changes. And so that's something Mike Leach will have to continue to evaluate. Uh, as he kind of moves this thing forward. I'm, I'm excited about the future, but that's one of those things. We have to be able to go out there and make the routine kick. And at times this year we struggled. And, again, they got better down the stretch. Not going to knock that. Biscardi made some, some clutch kicks for us down the stretch. But we shouldn't have to go out there and worry about a 25, 30-yard type field goal. we got to be able to go out there and make those uh, pretty much every time. We absolutely have to. And I go back to the beginning of the year when – in the offseason, people are like, you know, Biscardi's a guy that sometimes will shank an extra point. You think, oh, well, you know, we'll get it figured out. And then that, that was a real problem for us early in the year. No matter who we had, we changed kickers, we changed holders, and eventually we changed snappers. So it's not like we just kind of sat by using inaction, hoping things got better. We did things we expected to do in order to improve the things. But that's your statistical look back at the regular season. And, again, I do think there will be a lot more Bulldogs on the SEC list than there were in the preseason. I think that's, again, you, the proof is in the pudding. The postseason list matters more than a preseason list. You always want to be on a list if they're handing out play, awards for excellence. But when you go back and look at what Emmanuel Forbes did this year after he was so incredibly disrespected by the SEC media in the preseason, I think he has proven to use those snubs as a motivating factor. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by your friends at Portico. Brooks Bryan is my friend, your friend, a friend of Mississippi State, a friend of Starkville, Part of a great group of individuals that are bringing this wonderful residential development to Starkville. A lot of great places to live in Starkville, none better than Portico. Very easy to get to. You turn off 82 on a 12. The very first ride is Pat Station Road. You've passed that road many times and wondered what's at the end of it. They extended it a while back, which allowed Portico to be developed. That could be your new home, whether it be your primary residence, your ballgame weekend retreat, or, or your potential retirement home. They have a plan for you. You can still pick out a lot and have a say in your house plans. Or if you want to buy a home that's already under construction, you can do that too. Phase one's completely sold out. Phase two under development now, many of those houses already sold. So I encourage you to reach out to Brooks at 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. Make Portico your next move. All right, in the time we have left, let's talk a little bit about uh, basketball. We'll be transitioning more into basketball discussion here. Uh, your men's basketball team, 6-0, and oh, and uh, some big wins here. You're in the Barstool Sports Invitational. You win uh, that game, obviously, against Akron. You knock off Arkansas Pine Bluff. You beat South Dakota 79-42 in the regional round of the Fort Myers tip-off, a tournament that Mississippi State ultimately won. A big win over Marquette, 58-55, and that's a great program. Historically, Marquette has been very, very, very good. That's a big win. And, you know, state that's a game that many state teams, teams of the last 10 years, 15 years, probably lose. 
they found a way to get it out, and you hold Marquette to 55 points. You beat Utah 52-49. to Utah, a team, too, that's expected to do pretty decent uh, out there in the Pac-12. That's a good win for State. And that's the thing you think about when you look at these non-conference schedules. You know, a lot of teams out there beating up on the Mississippi School of Math and Science and, and all of that, but that's not Mississippi State. Mississippi State has scheduled decently and then has won those games. It's not enough just to play them. you got to win them. And Utah 5-2 and two overall this year. And so a good win for State on a neutral floor, and then ultimately you, um, you bring home a trophy. You bring home a trophy. And we did. And uh, we've been invited to these tournaments in the past and not done a whole lot. But uh, the next ball game will be later this evening, 6.30 p.m. in Starkville against Omaha. We're familiar with that. That'll be an SEC Network Plus broadcast. You'll be able to watch that. And also free kids court in the pregame in the Myers Pavilion for kids 12 and under. So if you're in Starkville, I encourage you to get out and go enjoy Mississippi State Men's Basketball. They'll be back in action uh, next Saturday in Starkville against Mississippi Valley State. It's also an SEC Network Plus. And then another big challenge for us, Minnesota. That Sunday we'll take on Minnesota in Minneapolis. And so State should probably cruise through these next couple ball games and probably be 8-0 and when we get the opportunity to play the Golden Gophers. And the Golden Gophers, of course, that's a Power 5 team. They're four and two, not really setting the woods on fire in a non-conference. But anytime you got to go on the road and play a team in their own gym, you better bring your best effort. They're three and one in their arena at this point, and then one and one on neutral floors. You know, their their one loss at home this year came to DePaul, 69-53. Pretty impressive uh, win for DePaul there. But uh, again, Minnesota not expected to win the Big Ten, but. Uh, Anytime that you go up there when an SEC team shows up, you know, the crowd's going to be kind of bonkers. So be sure and go check it out. You'll be glad you did. I think what we're starting to see at Mississippi State is that we want to be good in basketball. And Chris Jans and the staff have done a good job delivering a good product on the floor. I don't think there's any question about that. I think, we're, you know, what, what we've seen so far at Tolu Smith shows that they know how to utilize him to help kind of champion this program forward. Uh, Bulldogs are averaging 67.5 points a game, allowing just 48.5. Defense, obviously a tenant of the Chris Jans experience. Uh, Tolu Smith averaging 15.7 points per game and and 11 rebounds. So he's averaging a double-double per game. So I think you feel really good about the direction of things with him. Deshaun Davis, your second leading scorer, just under 10 at 9.8 points a game. DJ Jeffries, again, still some consistency there with him. Uh, you got to kind of work through that, but uh, arguably played his best basketball in a Mississippi State uniform. Pulling down five and a half boards a game, averaging 9.3 points per game. Cam Matthews, his scoring averages up too. You know, Cam used to be a guy that rarely scored unless it was just kind of, uh, you know, just kind of being the trash guy, just kind of putting things back up on the glass on, re- on offensive rebounding, but uh, has done a good job this year. Is his now averaging seven and a half points a game. Is that setting the woods on fire? It absolutely is not. Uh, but the fact that we're getting better offensive production from a guy that's been a defensive specialist, I think, says a lot about this coaching staff, too. All right, switching over to the women's side, the ladies are 5-2, and two, and, and arguably we feel like this is a tournament team when it's all said and done. Uh, they open with, of course, uh, you know, a two-game winning streak. They lose to South Dakota State, a team that beat Louisville, who was 10th ranked in the country uh, here a few days ago. Then they blast Alabama State. They beat Colorado State. They go to the Puerto Rico Classic. They take down Georgetown, then lose to Nebraska, 73-65. Their next appearance in Humphrey Coliseum will be this Tuesday, 7 p.m., against Louisiana Monroe. And then on Sunday, they'll host Grambling State. Those are two games State should win. And uh, we'll put together a what four-game home streak here. State should win all four of these games, Texas A&M Commerce and in Florida A&M. So you look at this and you begin to think, okay, you need to stack up some wins here. I believe you will. I think we'll be 9-2 and two when we hit the road again, and that'll be in the Suncoast Challenge against Old Dominion. That's uh, Nikki mccray Pinson's old team in Tampa, Florida, and we'll play New Mexico uh, that, uh, that Wednesday. So a chance for us to go out there and close out the non-conference schedule on a neutral floor against a couple quality opponents, and then we'll open up with Vanderbilt 
uh, in Nashville December 29th. So if you have an opportunity to get out and go watch the ladies play, I encourage you to do so. Many of you have become more women's basketball friendly over the last several years. I encourage you to continue that. Don't get caught up in um, the fact, okay, well, now the men are, are winning, so we have to kind of figure out and pick and choose. Over the last several years, we've opted for the women. But when you look at the quality of play on both sides now, both of these teams are worthy of your attendance and your support. And I encourage you to get out and go support them every opportunity you get. I want to thank all of our friends that uh, have been so supportive of the show all these many years. I know many of you have asked about uh, signed books. I get pr- almost daily this time of year. People say, hey, Steve, can I get a signed copy? Most bookstores have signed copies. If you can't get to a bookstore in Mississippi, let me encourage you to visit dogpilethebook.com, and you can get all my sports books there. That's Dogpile, Flim Flam, Stark Villains, and Alpha Dogs. If you need personalization, it takes a little bit longer to get it, because I'm not home right now. I'm out in New Mexico. So uh, if you just want a signed book, you can get those. And, of course, uh, Book Martin Cafe downtown has all five of my books. Uh, you can order Blooms of Oleander from Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksAmillion.com, and uh, you'll be glad you did. And I appreciate your support. There's so many of you that come and, and uh, visit, and we talk sports, and we talk about what it all means to all of us. And, uh, and I love Mississippi State. I love covering Mississippi State. And uh, excited about what's next. And a lot of people will always wonder, Steve, what are you writing about next? At this point, I don't know. I've enjoyed kind of having the year off to let my mind rest, but every so often I start thinking, I need to write this, or I need to write that, or I need to interview this person. So we may do another Mississippi State collection of stories books, similar to Villains and Alpha Dogs. Uh, I, I think we've kind of kicked around the working title as State Greats for that one. State Greats. Uh, probably have Will Clark in that one, hopefully Dak Prescott and a few others, but uh, the reality of it is there's a lot of stuff left to write about out there, and I've got a lot of things planned. So I don't know when I'll begin another book. Once I do, I'll let you guys know. Because uh, every time that I go to a book signing, people say, hey, Steve, what's next? You have a new book coming out. And uh, you guys are so incredibly kind to me. And uh, we've done, a, you know, I think a good job with all this. And you guys have certainly made a guy from South Mississippi feel incredibly special. Now, if you're looking for Stark Villains gear, you can find it at StarkVillains.com. I'd like to personally thank Matt Dudek on the Mississippi State staff for wearing a Stark Villain hoodie in the celebration photos locker room as he smoked his cigar. He's rocking a Stark Villain shirt. Uh, it's free marketing right there. And I didn't give him a shirt. He bought one on his own. So I appreciate that uh, immensely. Uh, my guy's out there kind of picking me up. And so I appreciate that. And if you would like to wear a Stark Villain shirt or hoodie, you can find it at StarkVillains.com. What I'd like to say, too, before we go, we won't go the full 90 today, but um, – you know, programming note, I, I'm t- so I'm not going to chat this week at jeanspage.com. I'm not going to chat, and if we do, it'll probably be later in the week. Maybe we do something Wednesday. Uh, but Monday, got a date with my lady, and then Tuesday we're going to spend a day together, probably go over to Santa Fe and see some things. Uh, there's a lot out here that I've never seen before, and I want to enjoy uh, the time with her. But uh, we will have a Wednesday show as scheduled. Probably run that Wednesday morning. Of course, I'm an hour behind you guys Uh, here in Mountain Time Zone. So might be a little later than normal, and I have committed to you guys to be a little more regimented with all this so the shows get up a little bit quicker. Uh, This time of year, it's a little more difficult uh, to find content, but uh, we're going to talk more about recruiting and, of course, about basketball and baseball be here before we know it. It seems like it should already be here, but uh, I think having the egg will allow the holiday season uh, to go a little bit better for all of us, and we probably want – be so miserable by the time baseball gets here. And in the last couple of years, you know, uh, men's and women's basketball have, have, have been disappointing. So that stretch between the Egg Bowl and baseball has felt like an eternity. And now that we have the egg, perhaps maybe it won't feel quite as um, you know, difficult. Uh, but we got a good ball game coming up. And, again, we'll find out next Sunday where Mississippi State is heading and, and who they'll play. Uh, there is a good chance that I will not cover the ball game. Uh, I'd I had planned a cruise this summer that ultimately got pushed back uh, due to some COVID stuff. You got to get a COVID test before you get on a boat. And despite the fact that my son wasn't even sick, his COVID test came back positive. Third time for him. Uh, But again, he recovered very quickly, but we had to push the trip back. And so I just felt like that I need to go spend this time with my family. I hope you'll understand. We'll have a a great crew of people there uh, to cover the bowl game. I don't know how many of the practices we are able to attend. But uh, Dave Murray and others will be down there kind of working through that to ensure that you guys are, are having some eyes and ears at practices and some boots on the ground. Uh, but finally, 
I just like to say, there were a lot of opinions out there about the direction of Mississippi State football. And I, and I'll admit to you at times I have been somewhat undecided. You know, I, I have, I, I'm a supporter of every coach at Mississippi State until they're no longer the coach at Mississippi State. And you may not agree with that, but that's how I feel about it. As long as they're our coach, I'm going to wish success for them because if they're successful, that means Mississippi State is successful. Now, Mike Leach, of course, we got off to the difficult start, you know, because uh, we had a lot of injuries. K.J. Costello didn't, didn't plan out the way that it did, but we're kind of reaping the benefits of Will Rogers uh, today, the experience that he gathered then. You know, last year, of course, uh, Will had the big year and hit, hit the – you know, hit the radar, and people were excited about Will Rogers. And, and this year, there's been some others that have, um, you know, have kind of been negative about Will. Uh, I believe that Will is fully capable of running this offense, and I think there is still some room to grow. People always wonder, is there a big jump between year three and four? I think this year, Will Rogers saw a lot different defense than he did the year before. It's all about development, right? So last year, all we ever saw was drop eight, drop eight, drop eight. Well, now we've proven that we can beat the drop eight. So as a result, people began to defend us much differently. I expect it now that Will has seen that, you will see Will be able to conquer that with greater regularity next year. Uh, but the reality of it is, is, you know, when we took Will Rogers, we knew that he had a ceiling, and every quarterback does. He is not the most mobile quarterback. And you're not going to run a lot of designed quarterback runs anyway. And that's not just because of Will. I think schematically – you don't want to put the quarterback at risk because this offense is so quarterback-centric. And so uh, I do think Will will, be, will take a step forward next year. I think Mike Leach will take a step forward next year. I think the strength of this running game will enable both to get better. I think it enables Mike Leach to call a variety of plays. And I think it gives uh, Will Rogers a lot more freedom at the line to say, you know what, hey, here's what they're giving us. I saw this last year. This is what they're showing us. This is where they're vulnerable. And, again, Will Rogers had to start before he was ready. Uh, but, again, maybe he didn't have the year that we expected. But any time that you lead the Southeastern Conference in passing, you've had a good year. may not be a great year, but it's been a good year. And, of course, now Will, one of the most prolific pastors in the history of the Southeastern Conference. And so with that established, the fact that maybe Will is not the most athletic quarterback, you know, what does that say kind of moving forward as we eventually transition into Sawyer Robertson and the Chris Parson years? You know, I think really we're probably where Will was somewhat limited is uh, maybe he's not as capable of buying time to extend plays. And I think some of that, too, is the people around him have to get better as well. There's a lot of rumors out there about certain guys that may transfer. Uh, I haven't even looked into any of that stuff. You know, the Egg Bowl just finished up on Thursday, and so I think it's one of these deals where you just got to wait and see what happens. But the reality of it is if somebody does leave, we'll replace them. We'll replace them. And sometimes there is addition by subtraction. I do know that there will be some players leave the roster. I don't can't say with any you know absolute confidence that they're star players, but there will be some guys that leave for more playing time. That doesn't mean that anything is wrong with your program. You only get a short time in life to play sports. If you're not playing here, you got to go somewhere you can. And maybe you've, you've worked hard for two or three years, and you say, you know what, I'm never going to be able to crack this depth chart. I have to accept reality. Maybe I've got to go play in Conference USA. Maybe I've got to go play in the Sun Belt. I got to get on the field somewhere. I got to show people what I can do. Not to mention, even if I'm not a pro prospect, I mean, I don't want to spend the last year or two of my college career, you know, just being a practice player. And so we look at it all very selfishly, right? We always say, well, it's about commitment. And it is in many respects. But sometimes the commitment to yourself and your own future has to maybe outweigh a commitment to a team, and that sounds really selfish, and that's maybe new age movement or whatever. But you got to be able to get on the field somewhere. If nothing else, just to make some memories and say, you know what, I want to make this payoff for myself. I can get my education paid for, and I can go out there and play the game that I love. And sometimes we forget about the joy of the game. There's not a lot of joy of the game when you're the guy at the end of the bench. You may enjoy being a part of it. You may enjoy being around the guys, but you want to get out there on the field. And think about how you would feel, right? And we say, well, I would never leave. And that's because, you know, we're the truest of the true maroon. You know, we're the folks that have been there through thick and thin. And so, yeah, we would probably stick with Mississippi State, even if that meant we didn't play as much. We'd say, you know what, I'd rather be a bench warmer at Mississippi State than a starter, you know, at Jackson State. Maybe that's how you feel. And I don't know. I I can't judge that for anybody else. But I do know that we are going to have some attrition. We are going to have some coaches leave. I can't say for certain who they're going to be, but I know there's going to be some guys that have some options. I think we're going to have to work hard to keep Zach Arnett. 
Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Auburn didn't make a run at him. I know John Cohen is a huge fan of Zach Arnett. I think Zach Arnett is a future head coach at some point. And he has been here now for three seasons, and I think he has proven this year to be a guy who's capable of, of calling plays and putting guys in a position to be successful against just about anybody in the country. He didn't always get the help from his offense that he deserved or perhaps his special teams. But, you know, you go back and look at the numbers against Alabama and Georgia, and, yes, those games got away from us, but it really wasn't about the defense. You look at the LSU ball game that fourth quarter, you know, the defense got beat up and so on social media, but we didn't get any help from the offense. And so, yeah, Zach Arnett, I think his name is on the rise again after maybe last year it wasn't so much. So that's something we'll have to continue to monitor, and there are always some position coaches out there that are looking to advance their careers and possibly get a coordinator spot somewhere. You know, Steve Spurrier Jr. was a guy that interviewed for some jobs last year, ultimately didn't get them. But that could be another name that you just you kind of watch. And I don't just throw these out there willy-nilly. These are established coaches with a pedigree of winning around them. So they're going to be in demand. Mike Leach has put together a good staff. Can it be a great staff? I think so. And that might require making some changes. And so just be on board for that. And when it happens, remember we talked about it. It's not a surprise. There, there are very few surprises that happen these days. And there are people out there that say, well, none of this guy's disenchanted. And sometimes when you have your, your exit interviews, you begin to find out what's the path for me. And then you have to make a decision based on that. You may have your position coach tell you, hey, here's the deal. Uh, we think that you're going to be here. And if that doesn't align with the goals of the player, then they have a decision to make. And the reality of it is if we have some guys out there that are never going to contribute on the field, we're better off calling them from the roster. And I think honesty is the best policy in every bit of that. You tell guys this is where you stand. We see you as a third-team guy. Maybe that means that you work on special teams. Maybe that means that you get into ball games late. But we don't envision you being a starter here unless there is an injury. And then you kind of leave it in the lap of the player. So be aware of that ahead of time. It's not like that you know, guys just going to, out of the blue, transfer and shock somebody. That there, That happens with rare exception. But there will be some opportunities for us to add some other players. And I think our recruiting needs will change a good bit here uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks because guys got to make decisions uh, sooner rather than later if they're going to get into a ball game somewhere else. And there will be some opt-outs for the ball game. That's just kind of how life works these days. There will be some opt-outs. You know, last year we didn't have uh, Charles Cross. We didn't have Martin Emerson. And then on top of that, we had some injuries and some COVID protocol stuff. A lot of that stuff is behind us now. But there will be some opt-outs. And uh, people have asked me, what do you think about Emmanuel Forbes? I could see it going either way. You know, he had that deal in the Egg Bowl where uh, he got his wrist lodged between two helmets and missed a few plays, but he did return. So we don't expect that injury to be, you know, long-lasting or anything. I think he'll be healthy and capable of playing in the ball game. And he is a guy that's very committed to Mississippi State. And so that'll be a decision that he'll have to make. Does he think that playing in that ball game – advances his draft stock? Does it, does it give him an opportunity to go out with a win, uh, to perhaps uh, hoist a trophy over his head? Maybe so. Yeah, but we'll see. But at this point, we're not aware of anybody opting out. But uh, that will, there will be some advisors that will encourage some guys, you should consider opting out and removing the possibility of injury. Then you look at a situation like Jeff Simmons, where Jeff and Montez and John all played in the bowl game. Nobody got injured, and then Jeff Simmons, of course, gets uh, injured in pre-draft workouts. It didn't cost him a first-round draft pick, but there are no guarantees in life. You can get injured in a ball game just like you can in practice or even walking down the hallway at school. You just simply never know. Nothing's guaranteed to any of us. All right, that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for your support. But until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. This holiday, whether you're making a Kroger Simple Truth Turkey for 40 or a Murray's Baked Brie for two, Kroger has fast, fresh delivery and free pickup so you can make holiday meals that bring you all together to create memories that last. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Free pickup on orders of $35 or more. Restrictions may apply. Choose from a great selection of digital coupons and use them up to five times in one transaction. Check our app for details. Kroger, fresh for everyone. This season, only Verizon gives you a free 5G phone with select trade-in and select 5G unlimited plans. And another gift. A service plan is required for gifts. That's a value of up to $1,900. But act now. This deal won't last long. 5G phone, up to $999.99 device payment purchase or full retail purchase with new or upgrade smartphone line required. Less up to $1,000 trade-in slash promo credit applied over 36 months. 0% APR. Additional terms and conditions apply. Visit verizon.com for offer details. Up to $1,900 value based on 5G phone, watch, tablet, and earbuds.